Okay, thank you very much. I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here today with you. Uh, it's my first time in India, and I'm really enjoying this experience. So it's great to be here. Also, I want to thank my collaborators in the work that I will show today, uh, Melinda Carpenter, Juliana Breuer, and Carla Kratchen. I would like to start with uh, a quote from Descartes. Uh, one of the greatest philosophers in Western philosophy. And this is a very well-known quote. Now, there is another part of this quote it, that is perhaps not literal, but in the writings there is another thing that you can add to this quote that I think that it sets up the, uh, my talk today very well, and it's this part. Dubito ergo cogito. The first part is cogito ergo sum, the second, the, the, the part that you can, you can glean from his writings is dubito ergo cogito. The doubt, as a saying would, would put it, doubt as the beginning of wisdom. So being able to doubt, being able to entertain different possibilities as uh, a way to, uh, to, to understand uh, knowledge. This is uh, the outline of the things that I would like to do today. And as you will see, my talk will fit nicely with the one that uh, Rob just gave a minute ago. Um, I will talk first about two approaches to metamemory, and I will go very fast on this section because Rob already did some of the things that I was going to do, but that's good because that's going to, I think, going to put the two talks uh, on, a, on a very uh, complementary basis. Uh, then I will talk about one, uh, one paradigm that we have used to investigate metamemory in, in the great apes, is the incomplete information paradigm. Then I will present you with some challenges and additional data. I will talk at the very end a little bit about monkeys and apes, and then uh, future directions. One thing that I would like to convey above all in this talk is how we go about asking questions and answering them. As you will see, an original piece of data can have multiple interpretations. And much of what we do in our daily work is try to see what are, which ones of those interpretations can explain the data better, the original data, but also new data that appear. In general, there have been two approaches to comparative metacognition. One approach, which is exemplified by, by, uh, by the work that uh, Rob has been presenting, is the, the, what we would call the, the escape response paradigm. In this situation, and here I have one of uh, Rob's experiments, he has already explained this, so I will not go into a lot of detail, a matching to sample task in which the monkeys are asked whether they want to take a test or not. And depending on what all the, the alternatives that, that, that they pick, they get different types of, of rewards or uh, punishment. Uh, as I say, I will not explain it uh, in, in detail because Rob has already presented this paradigm. He's, uh, he's already presented also some of this data, and here the question is, do individuals are more accurate when they can choose to take a test on a given trial? And the answer is yes. In the original uh, experiment that Rob conducted, two monkeys were tested, and both monkeys showed the same pattern. If they could choose whether or not to take the test, they were more accurate than if they didn't get this choice. Another piece of interesting uh, information that Rob discovered was this, that with increasing delays, and he has also alluded to this, to this data in a different test, but in the same test, he also asked the question of, um, does the time, does the delay from seeing the sample to choosing matter in the number of trials that they choose to decline? And in both monkeys, you can see that this is the case. This is the pointer, right. So in both cases, accuracy goes slightly down. More clearly in this other monkey, accuracy goes down as a function of the delay. That's, you could say, it's a forgetting, a forgetting effect. But the most interesting for us is this, that the, the, the percentage of declined trials increases inversely proportionally with the uh, accuracy of the monkeys. So this is one approach that has been used. The monkeys are facing an uncertain situation and they can choose to decline to take a test. 
Today, I will focus most of my talk on a different paradigm that Rob also presented, and this is the what we could call the incomplete information paradigm. And here, monkeys are not, they cannot escape the test, but they can seek additional information. This is the two tasks that Rob just showed you a minute ago. In this task, um, we and our colleagues uh, have tested different species, the great apes, and uh, also children. This is in the original experiment. I'll tell you how the original experiment works. And as you will see, all these tests that I'm going to show you are very, very simple. So the task is as follows. A subject faces two objects, and uh, it has to choose one of these two objects. One of them, you can see here, maybe you can see it here, has got food, is baited. The other one is empty. And the task for the subject is simply to choose the one that is baited. Well, uh, this is something that they do spontaneously. If they can select the tube that has the food, they go and do it. Okay? So this is very simple. And now what we vary is whether the subject sees where the food is being placed or not. And what, we, what they can do before they choose is they can also look inside the tubes. Now, looking inside the tubes is not going to produce the reward. The reward you can only obtain if you touch the baited tube. But we wanted to know whether they, uh, they will also look inside the tube. These are the results that we obtained in the first experiment. And here you see apes and children. In this experiment, we tested orangutans and chimpanzees. And as you can see, in the condition in which we hit the reward without the subject seeing, subjects are more likely to look inside the tubes before they choose, compared to the condition in which they saw where the food went. This data mirrors very nicely the data that Rob presented with rhesus monkeys. So now we have the same phenomena described in, in children, in apes, and also in rhesus monkeys. Now, what is the interpretation of these findings? Okay, another thing is that additional species have been tested, uh, rhesus monkeys, dogs, and also capuchin monkeys in this paradigm. I'll tell you a little bit more about the capuchins at the very end of the talk. Now, we originally interpreted this uh, finding as that subjects had some ability to uh, monitor the state of their memories, the state of the information that they possess about the location of their reward. With this initial piece of data, we also acknowledge that there are other possible interpretations. At least three interpretations, three challenges were, uh, were presented. First of all, is that perhaps subjects are simply when they do not have a representation of the food, when they do not have a memory, they simply search randomly. It's a generalized search. So the way they would work is they would search in the tubes or anywhere until they would find the food. And once they have located the food, they pick. It is possible that this explanation, which doesn't require any metacognition, could explain the results, could account for the results that I just showed you. The second explanation is a competing responses explanation. And in this case, the best thing that the monkey can do to get the food is to reach for it. But when cannot do this response, it does the next best thing. And in this case, when, the, when, when reaching for the food is not possible, you can just search. And finally, there is what could be called the voyeurism hypothesis, is that simply subjects simply like seeing the food. It's not that they have some, um, that they can monitor the state of their memories about the food, it's simply they just like seeing it. All these three hypotheses can explain the original results. And our task in the next uh, few slides uh, is going to show whether these hypotheses can explain additional data. One thing that we observe in the first experiment and that we replicated in, in, a, in another experiment, in this experiment we not only included orangutans and chimpanzees but also bonobos and gorillas. So now here we have all the great apes. We also had studied children before, as I showed you. One thing that you find, which was very interesting, is this selecting by exclusion. What you would see in some trials, 
in hidden trials, you would see there were two tubes, and the subject would look inside one of the tubes. In some cases, because they did not know where the food was, they would look inside a tube, and that tube happened to be empty. One thing you can do is look into the other one, or choose. In these trials, so about depending on the species, it ranges from 30, 30%, 33% to a little bit below 25%, subjects were choosing without having seen the reward. That is, they would look inside a tube, it was empty, and they would automatically choose the other tube without, I repeat, without having seen the reward. So in this case, we would say they are reasoning by exclusion, even without choosing the food, they are choosing correctly the other two. When they see the reward, these are these bars, they simply, most of the trials, they choose. They don't continue searching. They, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they search, they take the two. There is a, in another study that, that we did recently, um, the tube situation, there are not many places where you can look at. There is only one place that you can look at. And we wanted to know whether subjects, when presented with other stimuli, their, searchers, their searches would uh, fit the topography of these stimuli. We presented them with three sets of stimuli. We had cylinders, we had triangles, and trapezoids. And in every trial, we presented them with three cylinders, three triangles, or three trapezoids. They were never mixed together in the same trial. Now, if you are facing cylinders and you have not seen where the food went, you have to look from above. You have to climb here and look from above. If you are facing triangles that are oriented this way towards the subject, the subject sits here. In order to see where the reward is, you have to move to the side to be able to look through the side to see where the reward is. And finally, the trapezoids are oriented in this way to the subject. So in order to see where the reward is located, you have to come around and look from behind. So you can see the reward. The, questions, the question was, would subjects be able to search according to the type of container that they were facing? The answer was yes. Their first look, as you can see, for cylinders was basically directed. They, 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 they use looking from above. When the triangles, they look from the side, and the trapezoids, they look from the opposite. As you can see, the results are very, very clear, even on the first trial. If you consider all the data together, not just the first trial, all the trials, you see the same thing. So the subjects know where they have to look to see the reward. Now, one thing that I didn't mention that is important. These subjects, at the exception of the, of the cylinders, they had never seen these objects before. We especially built them for them, and before the test, we let them play with those objects. So they played with those objects for, say, five minutes, and after they had played with them, there was no food inside the objects, then we ran the test. We wanted them to be familiar with the features of the different objects, and then we ran the test. Even though they faced cylinders before, this was the first time that they faced cylinders in a vertical as opposed to an horizontal orientation. So here, the subjects know where they have to position themselves in order to see the reward. Now I'll tell you one thing that I do when I go on a trip. What I do is if it's an international trip, I go and, and take my passport, and I put my passport and my plane ticket in the front pocket of my carry-on bag. I do that the night before. I prepare for the trip, I do it the night before. And before I leave the house, I check that the passport and the plane ticket are still there. Now, why do I do that? It's puzzling, right? Do you do it too? Yes, so some of you do it too. So the interesting thing is I know where my passport is. I remember placing it there last night, and yet I look for it. Why? Because the cost of having a false memory is very high. I don't do that 
if I travel in Germany and I go by train because in case I don't have the ticket with me, I can get one at the train station with no problem. There's another thing that I don't do is if I just look at where my passport is, I don't look again after 30 seconds and again and again and again. Well, if I had done that, I would still be in Germany. I would not have been able to come to India. So the time that has passed since I last checked matters. So now we call this, the, Malinda Carpenter and I call this the passport effect. And we wanted to know whether apes would show the passport effect. Now, don't worry, we didn't give them passports to the apes and send them to see the world. We tried to adapt the methodology of the tubes to ask this question. We asked two questions. One is whether checking would increase as a function of the delay between baiting and choosing. And this would make a link with the data that I showed you before, uh, Rob's data with the macaques. And second, we wanted to know whether checking increases as a function of the reward quality. Remember, me leaving for a domestic or an international flight matters. So the procedure, as before, is very simple. So here we have um, the experimenter that is going to place some food in one of these tubes while the subject is watching. So the subject sees where the food goes. And then we cover, we block the, uh, the, the tubes so that the subject cannot check again. And then after a delay, we have two types of trials. In one type of trial, we simply give subject a choice. This is simply a memory task. In the other type of trial, before we give the subject a choice, we remove the two, the two blockers. So now subjects, if they want to, they can look inside the two before they make a choice. And then we compare. We have these two conditions. These are the results that we got. What you see here is, first of all, accuracy. Accuracy at retrieving the reward goes down with time. Well, it's a forgetting curve. No surprises there. The interesting thing is that the, the probability of looking shows the, 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 the opposite, uh, the opposite uh, relation. It increases with the time that has passed. This data mirrors the data that Rob obtained in the rhesus monkeys, the data for the two monkeys. So accuracy decreases with time. The percentage of trials in which they look before they choose, it increases. The interesting thing is the reduction in accuracy is 9%. But the increase in looking, it goes to 22%. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Why is this different? Let's go to the second question. Does checking increase as a function of the reward quality? Here we had, again, two conditions. In one condition, what we do is we hide a low quality reward, say, a piece of apple or a piece of carrot, while the subject is watching, just as before. And in another condition, what we do is we hide a piece of high-quality food, for instance, a grape, while, again, the subject is watching. And then we have a delay as before, and then the subject can choose. And it can choose, and, of course, if it wants to, it can also look. And the question is, even though they've observed both events, will they look differentially in these two events? The answer is yes. When there is a high quality reward at stake, they look more than if the reward is of a, of a low quality. There is one interesting thing, though, is that if one measures the looking accuracy on their first look, is they are perfect in both cases. What this means is that they remember where the food is. They are not looking randomly, they remember and they remember both for the high quality and for the low quality reward. And yet, there is a difference in, um, in the looking inside the two. So with these three new experiments, with, three, with these three new studies, now we can pose some challenges to the, to the three challenges with which 
I started my talk after the, the first original data. I'm tempted to call this slide the meta challenges slide. First of all, what about the hypothesis of the generalized search? Remember, this is our subject search until they find the food and then they choose. Two problems for, for these. First of all, the subjects pick without seeing the reward in, on average, about 25% of the trials. If they were following this generalized search, they should look in every trial that they have not seen the reward. They don't do that. And not only that, they choose accurately, even though they have not seen the reward by using inference by exclusion. The second thing is subjects do not search randomly because when they are facing containers with different shapes and openings, they know exactly where they have to position themselves in order to see the food. If it's a generalized search, we would have expected a random uh, random choices with each of those containers, and this is not what the data shows. The competing responses hypothesis. Here is, if you cannot reach, look. What happens here is subjects search more often with a high-quality food. If anything, because the high quality, they want it more than the other, it should be the opposite. But the data shows the opposite pattern. Even though this hypothesis predicts that they should, uh, they should, um, they should reach more often before they, they, they look for the high quality. They do exactly the opposite. What about the third hypothesis? They just like seeing the food inside tubes. This, this explanation, this data also goes against this because if this is what they are doing in their searches and, and seeing the food is reinforcing, why are they not looking into these tubes in 25% of the trials? And second, the difference between visible and non-visible trials and hidden trials, trials in which they see where the food goes, and trials where they do not see where the food goes, is difficult to explain. They should be, if what they are after is seeing the food, they should be looking the same in both conditions, but they don't. These are piecemeal hypotheses, perfectly reasonable hypotheses that have been proposed to explain the original findings. And with additional data, they, at least they cannot comfortably explain the data that we have today. But these hypotheses are what I would call piecemeal hypothesis. They try, they focus on one aspect of the data. There's been a more broad explanation for these findings, and this broad explanation uh, offered by Carruthers, uh, it has a different structure. And the way it goes is I try to explain here. Subjects, when they are faced with situations uh, in which uh, they uh, there is some level of uncertainty, and I think every situation in our lives has some level of uncertainty. They face a cognitive conflict. This cognitive conflict, according to Carruthers, produces anxiety. And this anxiety is what triggers the search. What subjects do when they escape, when they produce escape responses or they seek additional information is they try to resolve this cognitive conflict and if they resolve it, then they respond. At no point in this search, there is room for access to the information that they possess about the food, their location, or the stimuli that they face. This is, according to Carruthers, is information that is implicit, is information that is unconscious. What subjects are perceiving, what, objects, what subjects are monitoring is not this information is not their knowledge states. They are simply perceiving the anxiety that those knowledge states produces. These searches are automatically triggered and they are non-targeted. This is according to Carruthers. This problem, how, this, this, uh, this theory, this model, however, faces the problem of search specificity. This model has no room to explain why subjects know where to look. 
why subjects know what they are missing and why subjects know how to solve that problem. It can explain many other of the findings that I show you today, but when it comes to search specificity, it runs into trouble. This doesn't mean that this hypoth the hypothesis, Carruthers' hypothesis, is totally out. It means that one has to uh, at least reformulate, perhaps, this hypothesis to accommodate these findings. So, how, with what we know today, how would we accommodate seeking information in apes? These responses, what are the main features of these responses? First of all, this seeking behavior is targeted. The searches are not random. Second, the search behavior is integrated, which this means is that they can incorporate multiple types of information, including information that comes from inferential reasoning. Sometimes this information, this, this task that you saw here today, they have a very strong visual component, but sometimes if you give them auditory information about the location of food, then they don't look. That is, they can use information from a different modality to substitute the information they would get from, from vision. And I explained very quickly how this would work. Maybe I should have showed you this data, but instead of letting them see inside the tubes, instead of showing them where we place the food, what we do is we hide the food in private and then we shake the tubes. The tube that is baited makes a rattling noise. The tube that is not baited it remains silent. When now they are provided with this information, do subjects then look inside the tubes? And what we found in this, in this experiment is that they look less if they have been provided with the auditory information, and by the way, and they know where to, and they select correctly, than if they have not been given this auditory information, set in a different way. Okay, thanks. Set in a different way they can substitute. If they don't have visual information, they can use auditory information. And finally, the seeking information in apes is, um, uh, is optional, is uh, facultative. And here, the search depends on the cost of searching, and Rob also mentioned this, with the, the, if you, for instance, you have the tubes at a very high level, at eye level, they look all the time. But if you lower the tool, if you lower the tubes, they look much less. So the cost of searching matters, or also the cost of choosing wrong. This is the experiment I show you on the passport effect. If you choose wrong and you missed a piece of carrot, it's no big deal. But if you choose wrong and you missed a grape, oof, that hurts a bit more. This is the slide before the last one. And here I would like to bring up the data that I showed you with the apes, with data from monkeys, because ethologies, comparative psychologies, for us is very important to look not just at one species, but multiple species. It's the power of the comparative method. So what do we know? The two main paradigms, escaping trials or seeking information. We have data now on each of these paradigms for apes. I showed you the data that I show you fall here, but we also have data from other studies. Uh, our colleagues and us have data on other studies with apes showing also responses, escape responses in other paradigms. Also, we have this information for rhesus macaques. Uh, the, the, uh, the groundbreaking work by uh, uh, David Smith, also Rob's uh, work uh, in the escape trial responses, and also Rob's uh, work and other colleagues on the seeking information. So, rhesus macaques and apes, the picture is very consistent. And here comes a surprise. At least it was a surprise to me. When you test capuchin monkeys in the same way, and this should be read, the evidence for capuchin monkeys solving these tasks is really mixed. It's not clear at all that they are solving this task. If anything, they, for sure, the pattern of responses that you observe in capuchin monkeys is different from that observed in rhesus macaques 
and in apes. Why? Well, we don't know. But this is interesting because some of the explanations that have been proposed to explain the responses that I show you today have difficulty explaining why capuchin monkeys are not so good at it. Because from, the, from a mechanistic point of view, capuchin monkeys are as good as other species are doing things like different sorts of uh, conditioning. So why would we find this discrepancy? The next thing that we need to do, I think, is to test more the capuchin monkeys, but, and this is important, to add more species of monkeys and more species. In particular, I think, studying birds. Uh, it's, it's important to put birds into this situation. There is some work done on pigeons, and pigeons look a bit like capuchin monkeys, but it would be interesting to know whether corvids or parrots behave differently. Future directions, and with this slide I will finish. First of all, we need to test the anxiety hypothesis model. This is the Carruthers model. I told you there is one piece of evidence that it doesn't fit with that explanation, but we need to test it more directly. We need to measure anxiety, and second, we could manipulate anxiety levels to see what effect that has on the response of the subjects. Again, with an idea of testing Carruthers' model. And also, moving on to what we could say is more the, the control aspect of metacognition is most of the work that we have done in this paradigm has to do with monitoring memories. But for instance, it would be interesting to know whether, for instance, whether apes or other species will study longer when they are facing a test, when they are facing a particularly uh, difficult test, anticipating that their memories will degrade. So, so think about this. In the results that you have seen, most of the studies that have been, have been done, the monkey is asked, there's one or two exceptions, the monkey is asked to judge the memory after the delay. And it can decide to escape, it can decide to look inside the tube, etc. The question is, would monkeys and apes and other species be able also to anticipate that they will forget? We as humans know that we do that. We know when this is difficult to remember, we study longer. Or we write a note. So the question is, can we find evidence to show that monkeys and non-human apes, just like us, are capable of studying longer when they face a difficult test or rehearsing the response before the test. At the moment, we are trying to come up with some of these paradigms, but this is still work in progress, and today I cannot show it to you. Okay? So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. presentation about the memory or cognition, metacognition, etc. But what about when an animal is not given opportunity to see the things and the animal selects the correct things? There is a, a study has been reported in some journal and probably that uh, video I will search in my um, bag if I will show that. The lizard selected correct response or correct food without learning prior to that. Mm -hmm. So they have termed it as ESP, extra sensory perception. And before the animal saw the object, it selected very rightly. I'll show in the afternoon. If I have, I will search in my bag. OK. Um, what I will say is this. When the subjects are not allowed to see where the food goes, they choose randomly. And sometimes, of course, they choose randomly and they find it, but 50% of the time, if you are using two tubes, they don't. So we, this, is, this is what we find. Yeah, but I'm, I'm interested in, in seeing what you'll show later today. Uh, thanks for your wonderful presentation. I also uh, have a question similar like him, but not the same. Uh, like the uh, food, like you said, the, here the reward is a food. 
so whether you will starve the ape before the uh, like how long or any this one you have and then second question is that you mentioned that high quality and the low quality uh, one. so both are fruits actually grape and also the orange whether uh, that you selected according to the apes selection whichever they like or just randomly you put it like that yeah. okay yeah the first question is we don't food deprive them uh, it's they get their regular food and then what we do is we bring extra food for them to do the test so that's your first question the second question is before the test uh, we uh, we don't do this for every test but uh, during the years we have done tests in which we give them different choices so we know what is their preferred food so it is a subject that tells us which one is the food they prefer by simply presenting you present a, a grape and a piece of apple and you give them a choice which one they want people from each, uh, ape differently, right? some may prefer orange some may prefer uh, grape um, uh, yes and no. It depends, and I t I'll explain why. It depends on the foods that you choose. If you take something really low quality like carrot and something high quality like grape, there is no difference. Everybody prefers grapes. Now, if you go to foods that are more closer in value, then you start to see individual differences. In this study in particular, we use orange and grape because we knew that those were separate enough so that the individual preferences would not interfere with what they choose, what, whether they look or not. Yeah. Sorry, Professor Khan, if I have missed the explanation. So in the first experiment, uh, I have two questions. So in the first experiment, there is a cho uh, choosing by exclusion is around 25% to 33%. So that means the inferential reasoning is also restricted to 25 to uh, 33 percent of the trial of the experiments, trial, number of trials, basically proportion of trials. Yeah. So uh, why it is so that the inferential reasoning is being evoked in in a species? So why it's been restricted to a uh, lower proportion of time as opposed to higher proportion of time? This is the first question. And the second question is that uh, in a comparative paradigm, do we see a effect of phylogeny? Like say, for example, in uh, like in capuchin monkeys to uh, new old world monkeys. You know, apes, macaques, and capuchins, and therefore we have to be very careful with phylogenetic inferences. I think we need to study more monkeys to be able to be on safer ground. In terms of um, inferential reasoning of this kind, if you take the the tube task as an indication. I seem to remember that the capuchin monkeys are not as good as, for instance, the apes. But there are other tasks in which capuchin monkeys use inference. So it is not that capuchin monkeys cannot do inference. I would not go that far. Okay, that's your second question. Your first question, why only 25%? Well, what happens in the other 75% is what subjects typically do is they see that the tube is empty they take a second look on the other tube, and then they choose. They do, I mean, the thing is, if you want to be completely safe, that's what you should do. Look in both and then choose. The surprising thing, and that's why I presented it to you, is that they don't. In 25% of the trials, they just, you know, they see this one is empty, they go for the other one without looking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor, for your very informative talk. I'm Anuradha from the Center for Indian Psychology, Jain University. Um, my question is a bit of a layman's question in this field. And what I wanted to know is, I've heard of a study of certain monkeys off the shore of Japan who were given potatoes in the sand. And when a critical mass of them started washing the potatoes, about 100, the 100th one when they started washing, then they observed that monkeys in other parts of the world automatically went to wash potatoes and uh, so they, they seem to infer that there's some kind of a collective consciousness, monkey consciousness, that if a critical mass does it in one place, another does it. So one is what is your observation or what? how do you explain that? And the second one I was just wanting to know is that uh, like the capuchin monkeys, I think with rhesus monkeys and the uh, apes, they have, they've been used much more for doing these kind of experiments in comparison to the capuchin monkeys. So could it be something of this collective consciousness at work? Um, 
at the risk of sounding naive, I will say this. I think that the, the uh, observing the same phenomena in another part of the world, it could simply be coincidence. I mean, that's, that would be my explanation. I would like to see something more to invoke a collective uh, conscience or, yeah. So that's, that's what I would say. Um, the capuchin monkeys, nowadays the capuchin monkeys are used as much as, maybe not macaques, but for sure much more than bonobos or gorillas. So, yeah. But your study was showing with rhesus and apes. So I was just wanting to know whether you had more number of rhesus monkeys and the apes that were used for such, such experiments versus the capuchin monkeys. Because it could, taking that whole yeah. collective consciousness idea into account, it could be that down the line you'd have the capuchin monkeys that are equally effective in this experiment. As, as a whole, I mean, yeah, as a whole, yes. I mean, if you combine the apes and the rhesus monkeys, there are more apes and rhesus monkeys than capuchin monkeys. Uh, but again, I mean, I already expressed my, you know, um, doubts about the collective. But again, it's maybe I'm naive. Okay. Yeah. Your mic is not on. This is a very straightforward question. Do you regard metacognition as, uh, as evidence that the animal concerned is what Douglas Hofstadter called observant, just to remind you of what he meant, that an, a conscious being is, a, is in a situation of which he is aware, but he is also aware of being in that situation. And he can choose to react one way in the situation or to choose to react the other way of being in the situation. I have not thought about that. Uh, what I would like to get from this idea is some testable predictions Good. Uh, and then Good. Uh, test them. I want to make a, a, a deduction from it. Douglas Hofstadter specifically introduced the idea of the tangled hierarchy. If metacognition can be observed, could be interpreted as observe, being observant mm -hmm. in, that metas, in that sense, then it might be um, evidence that the intelligence of the being concerned is in a tangled hierarchy. That's the only uh, point I wanted to make from that, but it could be very interesting. I'd like to discuss it. Thank oh, you very okay. much. It was no a problem. lovely presentation. Thank you. Um, my first question is, uh, what were the ages of the apes and monkeys you experimented with? Uh, these are mostly juveniles and adults. We don't usually test infants. So uh, is, it, is it like... A this, um, um, the results of the experiments will vary among species uh, by age, like say one species will... Yeah, no, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, in terms of ages across experiments, the, the, the capuchin monkeys were not any different, I'm talking here from memory, but any different from the rhesus or, or the apes. In the experiment of the, uh, the food is placed inside the box and where you show the monkey that first you rattle the box, and then by learning, they uh, use this rattling process to find out whether the food is in one box or the other. So uh, have you tried without showing the monkey previously the rattling thing? Like without learning, did they try it themselves? That's, that's a very interesting question. And it brings up something again that I didn't say about that experiment because I didn't present it here. You can present this experiment. You can do the following experiment. So you take... Uh, two boxes, two opaque boxes. Forget about the tubes now for a second. And this is, this is the way we did it. So two boxes, opaque boxes, and you put food inside one of them. And then what you do is you rattle one, it's silent, and you rattle another one, and it makes a noise. Some subjects, from trial one, they are picking the box that makes a noise. This, I mean, as far as we can tell, as far as we can measure, there is no learning there. Whether there is a previous history of them learning that things inside boxes rattle, it is possible, but we don't know. Uh, there is another thing, is they never had those boxes before, and they, they, they did not experience that. So some of them do it, and some of them don't. There is another thing that is interesting. A minority of subjects can solve even the following problem. 
put in one of the boxes and the other one empty. At this point, the subject doesn't know where the food is. The, the, the subject has to find the food. And then what you do is the following. You take the one that is baited and you lift it, but you don't, you don't shake it. And then you, draw, you put it down. And in the other one that is empty, you lift it and you shake it. And of course, it doesn't make any noise. And then you put it down and you give them a choice. A minority of subjects choose correctly. That is, when you shake and it doesn't make noise, they pick the other one. Which is very interesting because this is an even stronger inference than the one that I showed you with the tubes. Now, but as I said, some individuals do follow, use the rattling on the first trial and others don't. And when you give that test, now in the context of the tubes, now we go back to the tubes. So now imagine you have two groups of subjects. One of them can use the rattling noise and the others don't. And now you give them the test with the tubes. And you shake the tubes, only those that had solved the previous problem can take advantage of this information and only those are the subjects that look inside the tubes less. The other subjects look the same. So for them, when you shake the tubes and it makes a noise, for them that is not informative. They look inside the tubes like as if you had not done anything. It is only those that have know the meaning of the rattling that can do this. What I had in mind was evolution of strategy, whether they can do it. Like a simple experiment maybe, like first you give them uh, tubes and uh, you, they're open at one side with the food inside. So uh, you showed that they actually looked inside, many, many of them, to find whether there is a food. After that you give them tubes which are closed, but which are like maybe they'll uh, want to tear them to see if there are food inside. And if they cannot tear the, tear the boxes also, maybe they'll start rattling them to find whether there mm -hmm. is food inside. Mm -hmm. So maybe this can show if they evolve strategies to find it. it that, is, that, is a, that is again a good point. And, and this is uh, uh, Elisabetta Bisalberghi and Connie Schrauf, and I think Ludwig Huber, have done some work where they give capuchin monkeys, they give them nuts. And these nuts, some of them have food inside and others don't. And then they see whether the monkeys shake them. And, uh, and yes, they do. Now, whether they are using weight, whether they are using the shaking, we don't know. But this has been described, at least for capuchin monkeys. Yeah. Let's have a last question. Uh, your talk inspired me to talk very briefly about some very unplanned experiments I had done in the field many years ago. 1993, 1994, so when I had started working with the monkeys, and there were two individuals who interacted because people kept feeding them, so uh, they would interact. And I did an experiment which was very similar to what you had done, except uh, there was a little bit of a modification. So I, uh, and I did this with the two individuals independently, and I had a peanut mm -hmm. in my hand, which I showed the monkey, yeah. and I showed the other empty palm, yeah. and I closed them, Yes. and they invariably chose the one, yes. whether the, you know, yep. the one that had the peanut. And then the other experiment that I did after that was I closed my palm and I moved my hand behind and I brought it out again. Yeah. And one individual, and this was N was very yeah. low, yeah. but one individual seemed to choose either, was random. Yeah. One individual specifically chose the other hand. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seemed as if that it was making, so you've looked at structural the specificity of choice or search using structural features. Yeah. I was wondering also whether there's been some experiments which have looked at functionality of these objects. So could the monkey be interpreting yeah, yeah. that when my hand goes behind, there has been a transfer to the other, or is it just novelty, or yeah. is it just uncertainty? Again, I mean, this is, this is, I think, a very, very interesting observation, a very interesting piece of data. I mean, to, to know this, we would just need more uh, to probe exactly what they may have done. And one thing that the field has become apparent is individual differences. And so you can have different individuals facing exactly the same problem and using very different strategies. And in this case, I mean, one monkey was, you know, you could, you could conceive it as, you know, 
random and the other one as you know always going for novelty as you mentioned so but again i mean it's something that one could look at yeah i mean one thing that we have seen is that we know that when the food creates a certain orientation in a container the food is the cause of that i mean you've seen a little bit with the rattling experiment the food is causing the noise you can also have the food create a special orientation in that case i mean the the, uh, the apes and i presume monkeys would do it too they can take advantage of that easily so if they see let's say you have two boards on a platform and you show them a piece of food and behind the screen you put the food in under one of the boards. Now you remove the screen. There is one that is like this and the other one that is like that. Which one they choose? They choose this one. And our interpretation of that, plus you know, some control experiments that we have done, is that the subjects are sensitive. The subjects know that the food is causing that change in orientation. Uh, with just what I just told you, that would not be enough, but we have other control experiments that rule out other obvious alternatives, and for now, this would be our interpretation. Yeah. So let's thank, thank the speakers, and time for our quick Thank you.